Mayor Suzanne Atwell. And uh, <laughs> let me bring up candidate Richard Dorfman. <laughs> candidate Susan Chapman. <laughs> candidate Linda Holland. <laughs> candidate Kelvin Lumpkin. Thank you for coming. Thank you for moderating. It, it's a pleasure to be here. I remember four years ago, can you hear me okay? I'm pretty loud anyway. Uh, about four years ago, I sat over there at my campaign table when I was running for office, and I couldn't eat, and it was the beginning of losing about 10 or 15 pounds during the campaign. Uh, this year, it's very different. I ate my dinner. I ate my lunch. I'm confident. I'm ready for another four years. For those of you who don't know me, and I'm sure there are a few who don't know me, I came to Sarasota. Uh, I cut my teeth on the mental health system. I was a psychotherapist at Coastal Behavioral, Jewish Family and Children's Service. Got involved in the community that way. So that I learned hard and fast, and this was 20 years ago. I've lived here 20 years. Hard and fast what the city is all about, and oftentimes the two Sarasotas. I'm I'm running again because I want to continue. I want another four years of bringing civility, cooperation, and I believe respect. Oh, that was quick. <laughs> oh, that was quick. You can finish your sentence real quick. Okay. Okay. All right, that's okay. That, no, just, uh, yeah, I just want to say I, I think I have replaced a lot of the contentious atmosphere of the last commission. I bring civility. Okay, just respect. Back. Okay. Thank you very much. Sorry. We've got a lot of things to talk about in only an hour to squeeze it in. Plus, I want to make sure that everyone has time to ask questions as well. Um, we have Susan Chapman. Hi, I'm Susan Chapman. And I want you to remember Chapman and not Susan because actually in everybody's mind there are two Susans in this race. Uh, my, my late husband, Jack, and I moved here 23 years ago because of Sarasota's great quality of life. We considered a lot of other places, but the lovely environment, the outstanding arts and cultural amenities made Sarasota our paradise. And almost immediately, I showed our commitment to our new home by getting involved in a lot of social agency boards and civic associations. And I was chosen the president of many and the founder of others. This service has led to my engagement in a variety of civic issues and good government issues, including acting as a special magistrate for Sarasota County for 16 years, um, being on the, uh, on the planning board since 2008. Thank you. I appreciate your vote. You're welcome. Okay, we have candidate Richard Dorfman. Hi there. I um, My name is Richard Dorfman. I first visited Sarasota in 1977, and it was always my dream to be able to settle here. Uh, about eight years ago, I bought a home here and uh, finally retired here, and I can honestly say in the last four years, I've been out of Sarasota a total of eight days. I love it here. I have a passion for the city. I want to serve the city. 
Uh, I think this is just about the best place we have on earth, and I want to be able to contribute. Uh, some of my background is I was a former director of broadcasting of the NBA. I lived in London for 23 years. I was a television sports agent. I represented things like the Wimbledon uh, tennis tournament the Soccer World Cup, Rugby World Cup, uh, the NFL, the USGA. My experience is in hard negotiating. It's about building consensus. I have a great deal of experience in that. I hope I can bring that experience to bear. I was here two years ago running District 1. I've learned a lot. I've listened a lot. I've made a lot of new friends. I consider Joe Barbetta and Paul Caragiulo two of my best friends. Thank you. Okay, we have candidate. You hear our conversation. Linda Collins. Thank you. Uh, I'm Linda Holland, and for over 30 years I've been a resident of the city, a neighborhood activist, a business owner, and a, and a community participant. Um, many of you in this room know me. You know me mostly for my crime-fighting activities in Gillespie Park, and also that I was one of the founders of the Coalition of City Neighborhood Associations. But I've also been a business owner, and I've had a, a good, solid background in the business community here in Sarasota. Um, one of the first organizations that I that I got involved with is the old Downtown Association, and so that and the North Trail. And I've been sitting through the North Trail meetings for as long as they've been having those, it seems like. You can see my, my full background on, on the materials um, that we presented today and on my website. But I will tell you, there is no other candidate that has the consistent record of community service that I have. Um, my education has been on the streets of the neighborhoods, um, in the businesses, the banks, and the restaurants on Main Street. Thank you. Candidate Kelvin Lumpkin. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for the invitation to be here today. Uh, I'm running for city commission. Um, years ago, I made a commitment to live my life serving others. And my running for city commission is just an extension of that commitment. Um, I'm a lifelong resident here. Um, I've been a pastor, started a church in 1999. Uh, I've also, uh, I'm a man of I do have a business background. I have a degree in accounting. I'm currently an MBA student at the University of Florida. I was appointed to the State College Board of Trustees by Governor Jeff Bush, then reappointed by Governor Charlie Crist. Uh, and I try to serve this community the best that I can. Um, I, I have some skill sets that I believe that the city is going to need in these years to come. Sarasota is an incredible place. I've lived here all my life and there's no other place I'd rather live. But we do have some challenges that we've got to face in the years to come that this next commission has to address if Sarasota is going to continue to be a great place. And I think my years of experience, um, my relationships that I've built in the city are going to be invaluable to helping the city move in the right direction. We have a looming fiscal crisis that we better pay attention to. Uh, we have crime that's running rampant in North Sarasota. And I believe we ought to find, this city commission ought to find an honorable way to help our homeless population uh, become self-sufficient. Self Thank you. Thank you. And candidate Pete Tyson. I'm Pete Tyson. Thank you for having me. In one minute, we'll cut to the chase. The main issue is whether development is going to pay its own way or whether these millions and millions of dollars of costs are going to be loaded upon the taxpayers' back, you are the taxpayers. So, if they pay it, you don't. If they don't, you do. Okay, well, okay, I'm not banking that time though, Pete, I appreciate it. Okay, what I've done is I've put a bunch of questions together and I've broken them down into categories. My goal is to get as many in as possible before the time is up. I expect that the very astute audience member, uh, members will pick up where I've left off when we open it to the forum of, on the floor to ask questions. All right, the first set of questions I want to ask is regarding the role of the commissioner. The lines are sometimes blurred between the city advocate and the role of the city commissioner. The candidate panel is divided between those who have worked for many years advocating on behalf of citizens of the city and those who are relatively new to the area but feel the world experience is enough to offer the city. I would like to know that everyone has a clear understanding of what the role of the city commissioner is. So I'm gonna ask you a two-part question. One is just a yes or no answer and then the other one you can embellish on. First one is, have you read the city charter plan? And do you think it's appropriate for a city commissioner to put an amendment on the ballot? Um, or should the amendments always come from the city, the charter review committee or the citizens initiative? I'm gonna start with Kelvin Lumpkin. Um, yes. 
And I do think in some situations it is appropriate for a commission to do that. But I think in doing that, that commissioner needs to uh, hear the voice of the people, uh, hear their concerns before doing so. But yes, I believe that part of the commission's role is to provide leadership. You're a consensus builder, you're a judge, but I do think that our commission needs leadership. And I can, I could perceive a time or conceive a time where a commissioner might, uh, if, of course, if that commissioner is acting in the city's interest, feel compelled to do so. Okay. Pete Tyson? I have read the charter. And on, on certain circumstances, they'd be very rare circumstances, but in certain circumstances, the commission as a whole could, uh, could place an amendment on the ballot. This doesn't mean it would pass. But this would be a very rare circumstance. I, I'd say almost a last resort. Uh, I don't uh, envision doing anything like that myself. But I can't say it's just absolutely improper. OK, thank you. And Linda Holland. Yes, I have read the charter, and it does provide for that circumstance. And so I would be uh, sworn to uphold the charter, and that's part of the charter, so my answer would be yes. Susanna, well, I'm sorry. Susanna. I know. <laughs> you think uh, I would know that, right? No. <laughs> yes, uh, I do believe. Um, uh, I have read the charter, and yes, um, I believe that uh, Commissioner does have the opportunity to uh, bring an amendment uh, for referendum. I, however, I think we need to be careful as what um, Mr. Lumpkin said. We need to take it out. We need. We need not to do it in isolation. There's a way it can be done that brings everybody involved in it and it makes sense, but we need to be careful how we do it. Okay, and Ms. Chapman? Um, thank you. Yes, I've read, I've studied, and I've advocated on behalf of our current charter and elections, chairing committees, electoral committees on behalf of it. With regard to the city commission making charter changes or putting charter changes on the ballot, I'm absolutely opposed to it. I think the only role for the city commission in that case is errata amendments or small charter changes that deal with changes in state law or something like that. Otherwise, I think the charter review committee process is the most thorough, most thought out process. Mr. Dorton. I have read the charter, and, and it's, a, it's sort of a double-edged sword, the second part of your question. I think the commission should have the opportunity to bring charter amendments, but I would hope that whomever, if that is a single individual, that they don't take advantage of their position on the commission and use the commission as a bully pulpit to force certain amendments they, they may be in, in, in favor of through. I think collectively the commission should be able to do that, but I think it must be done in the sunshine. I think you must absolutely listen to what the people want and not take advantage of your position as a commissioner to put through things that may not be in the best interest of the, uh, the complete population. Okay, my next question is, what are the things that you feel only require administrative approval, and what things would you put up for a public hearing process? I'm going to let Ms. Holland answer that question first. Sorry, got to start with a tough one because um, I've been, we, we have administrative approval in our code, and so for the most part, I support the administrative approval process, and I, I've seen it work um, very well. I, I use the example of Citrus Square on Orange Avenue, close to the neighborhood that I live in, and I think that's a, a perfect example of it being used properly. Mr. Lumpkin? Well, our master plan makes provision for, for what should be approved administratively and what should not. Um, now, if we as a community feel like we need to change the zoning, then we need to have that conversation. But I think for the most part, I support administrative approval. Um, I believe it gives those who want to invest in our community a predictable, uh, a predictable set of circumstances. Um, and, and so I think we already know that. But if we feel that something is going to have a negative impact or what we have doesn't work, then let's have that community conversation. Uh, but I do support it. But but the question is, what are the things that you would that you would be inclined to have for administrative approval versus public hearing? Can you cite anything that would differentiate between the two? Um, if I'm understanding you correctly, Susan, obviously, in, in Kenai is a great example of something that, of course, happened before our current rules, but obviously is not a good project for where it is. And so, depending on how it's going to impact the neighborhood. 
Um, I think we have, if it's going to have a disruptive impact on neighborhood, then I think those are the things that need to go to public hearing. Um, I think if someone is investing from out of town, for instance, who's investing in our city doesn't know the neighborhood, they may not be sensitive to the concern uh, of the neighbors. And so it would be something that would be out of scale that I think should be heard by the public and make sure that they voice it. Okay, thank you. Ms. Atwell? Yeah, I think um, there obviously there's a, a threshold, but I, I believe in administrative approval. I think uh, oftentimes, sorry, I think oftentimes this is all about trust uh, in city staff. Um, uh, we need to, you know, look carefully at we hire city, city staff. They have the resumes that perhaps we don't have. I certainly believe there needs to be a threshold, as what was said, about uh, neighborhood input. Laurel Park, we just got through with the deliberations on a Laurel Park overlay. And, you know, I must say that was quite a compliment. Uh, and depending on how you feel about it, that we, I wanted one community hearing, but it came out that it was, it was two community hearings uh, before we move on with that. But I think fundamentally, we need to decide whether we trust staff or whether we trust that administrative review. Can you say this in an example of where you don't think it should be put up to public hearing? Where uh, certain things downtown, um, obviously certain thresholds are in place, but I think it's very difficult to say, depending on no, I'm not rude. Uh, when, when developments come down down the pipe, we need to be really careful uh, what what uh, are the thresholds for height, for density, because I'm a believer in density. So you're asking someone that is trying to look at the whole picture here. Okay, thank you. Mr. Dorfman? I, I believe in administrative approval. Um, I am not for putting another layer of, of bureaucracy and red tape that will prevent our city from growing. The city needs to be very vital. The city has an opportunity to grow. And I think administrative approval is one of the things that, that help that help the city move along. I think we also we have to look at administrative approval also in terms of compatibility. We don't want the wrong things in the wrong places. So I think that's something that needs to be looked at. I also think that the neighborhood should have a say in what's going on in, when, when there is building a development in that, that has the potential to impact the neighborhood. They have to have the opportunity to speak out. But the other thing is we also have to respect property rights. Everybody's property rights are equal. So administrative approval, yes, for the number of caveat, number of caveats and the opportunity for neighborhoods to participate. Okay. <laughs> Chapman? Yes, please. Um, yes. Uh, I, what we have is administrative approval all the way through the city when a site plan is less than 5,000 square feet. With regard to other areas of the city, in the downtown, we have the downtown master plan, which is presumed to be so detailed that there's no discretion in it, and that's why there's administrative site plan approval in that. Uh, with regard to the rest of the city, I am not in favor of extending administrative site plan approval unless there is a clear standard uh, with regard to design, with regard to mass, with regard to scale, and we don't have that. There is an assumption in administrative site plan approval that the role of the staff is the same interest as the neighborhood. The role of the staff is to be a neutral between the development community and the neighborhood, not to advocate on behalf of the neighborhood. I also believe there's a First Amendment that allows citizens, when their property is affected, to be to have the right to organize and to petition the government for redress. If, can I, is there an example, though, of anything that occurred in the city that you would say would be one clear role or the other? Uh, well, there, there are examples that come before the planning board all the time. For example, just the last session, um, a property was going for a rezone and they didn't want to do an administrative, they didn't want to do a site plan in advance. And they wanted to do it saving money. And basically they came forward and I asked the question, if the North Trail Overlay gets administrative site plan approval, will the neighborhood have a say so? And the answer is no. But the neighborhood that was affected was a, a, a very special individual neighborhood that has can you be specific? What neighborhood? Huh? Can you be specific? The Tahiti Park neighborhood. Okay. The Tahiti Park neighborhood. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
another another example is the okay we got it we're good oh, on time okay sorry that was a thank you i appreciate it <laughs> okay mr tyson well there there are uh, a number of cases spelled out in the rules about administrative approval i think the the controversy we had a few years ago was uh centered around broadening that. I do not favor broadening it. Also, uh, I, I think there's an example currently uh, playing out. It appears to me that Walmart was administratively approved. It's a, oh, well, they said it, it fit everything. But then uh, the freedom of speech that Ms. Chapman speaks about kicked in. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> All right, did I ask everyone that question? I apologize. I've now got a pen so I can, I can track it. Okay, the next question is 30 seconds. We're going to limit, limit you to 30 seconds. All right, the county has to resi has a resign to run ordinance to run this county commission. Should the city adopt a similar ordinance? The county has a resign to run ordinance to run for the city commission. Should the city adopt a similar ordinance? Ms. Atwell, let's start with you. So what, when you run when you run for office, if you're on any panels or advisory boards or anything associated with the city, should you be required to resign that position in order to run for office? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough question. Um, but I think um, you need to pro I think there could be it could be replete with conflict of interest on certain issues. So I think we really need to be careful of that when you're on something that you um, until the election's over, it, it might be a good idea uh, to withdraw from that because I think a lot of questions are going to be asked that you can certainly recuse yourself. I can recuse myself because I'm a city commissioner and uh, things I won't answer because they're pending. Okay, I apologize for the adjustment in time. Uh, apparently we need to move a little bit faster and I should have warned you ahead of time. We're only looking for a quick, precise 30 second answer. Oh, 30 seconds. 30 seconds, my apology. Uh, Ms. Chapman. First of all, there is resign to run in the Florida Constitution, and it, it does not define it the way the county defines it. But I do not agree with it. Many of our most qualified candidates are the people who serve us on advisory boards, such as the planning board, such as the parks board, such as all the advisory boards. So we, we give a difficult choice for candidates who are engaged in their city requiring them to resign to run. So I do not agree. We would not have some of the candidates we've had before if they had had to resign from the planning board, for example. Thank you. Mr. Tyson. Uh, yes, I think uh, resigning to run is a good idea. Um, I don't see how I could campaign if I had other responsibilities. Thank you. Mr. Lumpkin. Uh, that, that's a tough one. I've pondered it myself. I'm currently on the city's police advisory panel. <laughs> and have contemplated resigning myself while I'm running for office. Uh, but I would tend to say no, uh, unless we, unless it's going to be a 